Um, I think this is, we have one more lecture to go for this academic year. Um, it's the, the, the main goal of this nano lecture series is to bring together um, the applications and implications um, on the same platform. And that's something that is needed for nano safety research. So we have uh, a number of uh, investigators from the NIHS Nanotechnology Health Implication Research Consortium participating, and uh, that's why we are webcasting this uh, this nano lecture series um, across the country. And also, we have some participants from Europe and all the way to Singapore. I think we have some collaborators uh, participating. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm very uh, pleased and honored to have uh, with us today Jason White. Uh, I know Jason for quite some time. I won't go through uh, his impressive CV. Uh, Jason comes from, the, he's the head of the Department of Analytical Chemistry and Vice Director of the Connecticut Agricultural Experimentation Station. He's well known in, in, in the field and um, uh, I asked him to uh, come and present on the uh, applications in the agriculture domain. And it's an area that um, uh, nanotechnology can really assist us in terms of uh, uh, not only improving the quality and the safety of the of our food systems, and that's uh, we all know with climate change in particular that there is a lot of stress uh, to our society, and uh, nanotechnology uh, um, can really be very helpful in that area. So uh, Jason um, is very active, uh, um, both at the personal level, but also his um, experimentation station in Connecticut, which I visited uh, a month, two months ago, and I was very impressed with the uh, interdisciplinary research. Uh, so it's a kind of a small uh, uh, um, a, a mirror of our research activities. So they cover uh, everything from uh, analytical chemistry to applications, implications, and um, they have all these omics platforms in place. So, um, so uh, without further ado, I think I will uh, uh, invite Jason to come to the podium and uh, you know look forward to your talk, Jason. And welcome to Harvard. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm soon. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation. How do I advance? Left click. There we go. <clears throat> well, thanks for the invitation to, to come speak today. Um, so the Agricultural Experiment Station is a state agency. Uh, I'm the vice director. Um, having the title changed to the director of vice just because it sounds better than vice director. Um, <laughs> Uh, but as Phil said, we're largely a research-based institution, and I run the uh, analytical chemistry department. Uh, so what I wanted to do today was uh, talk about some of the uh, projects that we have going on uh, nanomaterials, nanotechnology in uh, food and agriculture. I wanted to um, go through all the different kinds of projects and experiments we have going um, to kind of give you the kind of the, the overview uh, and the, the broader perspective. The, the downside to that is I don't get to talk about any particular set of experiments in, in detail. So if anybody wants to do that, we certainly can. But I thought it might be more important to kind of give you the overview of the, the kind of work that, that we've done in the past. Uh, so obviously nobody in this audience really needs this slide. Uh, so the real reason I wanted to put it up here um, was to basically show you that, um, so if you look at the funding for the NNI, uh, and I, in the current budget year at least, it used to be 1.5 billion. I'm not sure what actually came out last week. Uh, but when you, when you look at the, the agencies being funded, what you see is that the USDA, uh, which is agriculture, obviously, they are a very tiny piece of this, this federal funding pie. Uh, and most of my work up until very recently has been on implications. And if you look over here, implications are a very small piece of the funding pie. So I work on the smallest piece of the smallest piece of the pie, uh, which creates some, some issues. But uh, I think some of the work that we've done is, is fairly interesting. So we'll, we'll go through. Th through some of that. Here are all the, uh, the different applications, obviously, uh, where we're seeing nanotechnology. And as an agricultural experiment station, uh, obviously, our, our focus is really on food and food production. 
Uh, so the way I kind of envision this breaking down, uh, you have you have food production in general, and agriculture is a big part of that, and that's that's where I spend most of my time. But in terms of nanomaterials and and food safety and food protection, there there are two other areas that are worth worth discussing, or at least worth mentioning. These aren't areas I necessarily spend a lot of time in, um, but we do have food safety. Obviously, there's some here. This is uh, you know the the I've been doing with engineered water nanostructures I think is really important. Uh, but an antimicrobials, food packaging, sensors for pathogen detection, all of that's important. Um, so that's food safety. And the real, the real difference between food safety and food defense is kind of intent. You're basically looking for the same things, uh, whether it's chemicals or microbes that are not supposed to be in food. In food safety, they get there accidentally. In food defense, somebody has put them there intentionally. Uh, and uh, so obviously, the, the sensing part of food defense is a much more important uh, part of this. Uh, so my laboratory, we're actually part of an FDA chemical terrorism network called food, uh, FERN. It's the Food Emergency Response Network. Uh, and our part of it is analytical chemistry, so it's mostly LC, GC, ICP work. Uh, but there are people in that, uh, in that network who are very interested in some of these newer platforms for detecting certain kinds of, of agents like Ebola or bacill uh, Bacillus anthracis and so forth and so on. But obviously, the focus of my group is really in agriculture. Uh, and nanotechnology and agriculture is, is it's one of those interesting areas where if you do a web of science search, you actually get more review articles than you get research articles, uh, which tells me lots of people are really interested in this, but nobody's really figured out how to do it yet. Uh, and, and, when you, and when you look at what's been published, 75 to 85% of the papers in the literature uh, or China, or there's some from Pakistan. So there's there's really not much of this happening uh, in 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 a lot of areas, and I I think that is going to change, and it should change. Uh, but the overall goal here uh, is really to increase production. Um, you know, there there are a couple of issues. Uh, you know, the, perhaps the most important, which is we already have great difficulty producing enough food for the people we have on the planet. That is not a problem that's going to get better considering the change in climate. And yes, the climate is changing uh, and, and increasing population. Uh, so uh, the, the real focus here is can we use nanotechnology to, to address that problem, to essentially produce more food more quickly, to use less resources to do it, and to minimize uh, the waste. And in agriculture, the waste is huge uh, between you know, depending on the estimates that you look at, where from 50 to 75 percent of the pesticides and fertilizers that a typical grower puts on their field never makes it to where it's supposed to be. So the, the inefficiency is just is just dramatic. Uh, and that inefficient inefficiency is wasted resources. Uh, so a lot of nanotechnology is really uh, kind of focused on this concept of precision agriculture. Can you increase the efficiency? Um, not just in the agricultural portion, but across the whole we were talking about this morning, the whole farm to uh, activity. So some of the traditional applications are listed here, nanofertilizer, pesticides, treatment of waste, and sensors. Uh, I'll just go through some quick examples. Uh, and fertilizers and pesticides, the nano aspect of this is, is uh, as I mentioned, largely to try and increase efficiency. Uh, so, you know, if you've got 70% of the fertilizer that you're putting on your crop is never making it to your crop, can you alter that formulation in such a way that the efficiency is much greater? Can you encapsulate those nutrients somehow or, or target their uh, delivery or, or time their release? So a lot of uh, that effort is really focused around uh, a, a delivery. Uh, there is literature suggesting certain nanoparticles will stimulate the growth of the plant themselves, a little bit on titanium. Uh, there's a couple of groups looking at carbon nanomaterials. Um, the, the downside to that, obviously, is then you have food with carbon nanomaterials in them. Uh, and cerium is another one that's been shown to, to increase plant growth. Uh, sensors we talked about already, it's, it's not just to detect pathogens, though. It's to, to help the grower do this, this, what's called this precision agriculture, figure out exactly when the water needs to be added or exactly when the nutrients should be, uh, should be delivered. Uh, and then nanopesticides, it's kind of the same model as the nano fertilizers, with the exception that the pesticides are organic molecules, so you have to worry about degradation as well. So increasing 
predictability as well as efficiency of delivery is is an issue. Uh, and um, you know, a lot of these products are actually already making it onto the market because the the regulatory framework here isn't isn't very well developed. Uh, but again, these are products to increase stability, solubility, release, uh, and and there's even some some groups talking about targeted delivery. Uh, you know, almost analogous to the human human disease model. If you can get a specific pesticide to a specific location where the the pest, the insect, the fungus, the protozoa, the bacteria is, get it to the infection site. Again, it's all about increasing efficiency. So, um, you know, if you can double your efficiency in pesticide delivery, you can cut your usage in half. So um, there's multiple multiple benefits going on here. I threw this slide actually in just kind of at the last minute because there was this meeting uh, in November uh, in Beijing. Uh, it was organized by USDA. Uh, a number of uh, antees from the USDA now were in this meeting, uh, and it was hosted by Federal Sciences. One of the areas where they really are embracing nano-enabled agriculture uh, at, a, at a rapid pace. They actually, uh, they have a, a designated research center uh, within CAAS uh, for nanoscale science and agriculture. So this was a really interesting meeting, uh, not just because everybody got to present their data, but there was a real focus on, you know, where do we go from here? What are the, what are the things we should all be working, working on and talking about? So a lot of that's gonna come out um, in a special issue of Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry. Um, people are submitting their papers now. The due date was May 1st, um, so so we can look for that. But it was it was a really interesting meeting, and it was, it was really focused specifically on nano enabled agriculture. So that was kind of a, a long winded introduction to to get us to the work we do at the experiment station. Now I got into the area of nano about 2008 2009. Uh, my time working on this, what you know what I and most other people call nanotox, which is really just the implications, uh, and looking at a couple, and still looking at a couple of of kind of broad questions uh, in terms of what happens to food crops or organisms related to food crops when they're exposed to these nanomaterials in the field as as the plants are growing, uh, including things like uh, what molecular basis of the plant response and how does that molecular response influence uh, nutritional content, for example, uh, and then uh, looking at things like trophic transfer. If the nanomaterial is in the soil, how does that nanomaterial move from the soil to the food crop to the animals, including humans, that are eating that food crop? Does that nanomaterial move differently than, say, a non-nanomaterial that's the same element? Uh, and then co-contaminant interactions. Agricultural systems are obviously very complex. There's a whole range of other organic and inorganic constituents that are already there. What happens when nanomaterials are thrown into the mix? Are they going to interact with these uh, analytes? Talk about, uh, I'll go through some of those experiments. This area up here, the applications work, I'm actually um, you know, much, much newer to. We just got into this a year or two. Uh, and this is actually the story I'll start with. Uh, where we're specifically using different kinds of nanoscale nutrients to suppress disease. And if you can suppress crop disease, you can increase yield. Uh, and I'll go through a couple of, of those projects. But this is, this is the general overview. Um, it's a new, um, new research initiative at the experiment station. The focus right now is on fungal diseases of roots, which limit agricultural productivity from 20 to 25 percent. Um, reduce it by 20 to 25 percent. Uh, so it's a it's a significant issue. Uh, and what we know is that many of these micronutrients, things like copper, manganese, zinc, magnesium, they will stimulate plant defense, just like vitamin C will stimulate human defense. And if you can stimulate plant defense, you can seemingly uh, prevent disease or at least minimize it. And as I'll show you in a minute, the issue with many of these micronutrients is that they're very limiting in soil. So the plants always starve for these nutrients. So we ran some initial experiments and then used that as preliminary data to get a USDA grant, uh, which just started last year. Uh, and then we also this year got a, a USDA specialty crop block grant, uh, which was much smaller, but to, to look at some other specific crops. But the issue was all about nutrition. Um, nutrition is, is the first line of defense for most organisms, including plants. Uh, and in, new, in, in roots, um, the micronutrients are really important by uh, a number of pathways. They stimulate these enzyme pathways uh, 
uh, which provides the, the plant's defense against fungal infection. The soil is just loaded with all sorts of fungal pathogens that are waiting to infect the plant. Uh, and these uh, secondary metabolite pathways are very important to, to defending that, uh, to enabling that plant to defend itself. But there's two problems with micronutrients. Uh, the first problem is that, and this is an old uh, picture from a 1940s soil chemistry textbook, uh, the fundamental problem is that as soil pH approaches neutral, which is where many agricultural soils are, the availability of many of these important micronutrients just drops through the floor. They're completely unavailable in soil, and if you add them to soil as a fertilizer, they just become unavailable. Uh, so you can't really feed them to the crop effectively through the soil. So, okay, let's just put it on the shoot system. Well, that doesn't work well either because most plants haven't evolved mechanisms to take these nutrients from the leaves and to send them to the roots. Plants evolve to take things from the soil and the roots and send them to the shoots. So you apply these nutrients to the shoot system as, say, a miracle grow, grow foliar spray, and they just stay in the leaves uh, or the shoot system. They don't really get sent to the roots. So that leaves you with very limited options in terms of how you're gonna treat one of your crops, whether it's wheat, soybean, eggplant is one of the models we work with, um, when you have root disease because you can't get these nutrients to the roots to help the plant defend itself. So what happens when chemists talk to plant biologists? So a chemist and a plant, biolo plant pathologist walk into a bar and that's, that's literally not the beginning of a joke. That's how this story happened. Uh, a colleague of mine, Wade Elmer is a plant pathologist. We went out for drinks one night after, after our annual open house. Uh, and um, I was describing a paper that we had just published in, in 2012. Uh, it's a, it was, there was a variety of things we were doing, but one of the things was we were doing, this was done with a group in China. We, and, and the graduate student set up this split root system where he exposed uh, one part of the root system of the corn and hydroponics to copper oxide nanoparticles and not the other. Uh, we did a variety of other things, one of which was we looked at this side of the root system for copper. And what we did was we found increased copper in that side of the root when it was a nanoparticle exposure, but not with the ionic or bulk exposure. And we confirmed that we actually had some nanoparticles there. So to us, that just seemed like a pretty cool finding and observation. Uh, xylem and phloem based transport, that's what we called it. Well, my plant pathologist colleague became very excited, excited to the point of being agitated. And if you've ever seen a plant pathologist get excited, it's pretty funny. Um, because remember what we just said, this isn't supposed to happen. Plants are not supposed to be able to send things like copper from the shoot system to the roots. Uh, and so this is how I got involved in kind of this nanoscale nutrient application work. So what would happen if you had a plant growing in the field and instead of giving you your typical miracle grow micronutrient solution, you actually supplied copper and manganese in nanoscale form? Would you get a different effect? Would these metals, uh, would these nutrients be translocated to the roots? If they were translocated to the roots, would this stimulate plant defense? And would the plant be able to fight off some of these fungal pathogens that are reducing yield by 20, 25%? So we did some quick and dirty kind of greenhouse and field experiments. And the answer to all those questions was yes, by the way. Uh, and uh, this is just some of that initial thing. I'll walk you through it real fast. Seems to be the element that works the best for us so far. Uh, so this was a, just a single foliar application to the seedlings before we either did a greenhouse study or actually moved them into the field. Uh, and what we saw, and so the green bars over here are copper. This is disease. This is the degree of disease. And this is the, the, the bar in the middle is the copper nanoparticle. So when you supply the copper nanoparticle, you get significantly less disease. In this case, this is the eggplant. You find significantly more fruit produced from those copper nanoparticle treated plants. And you find significantly greater copper in the root system, which is basically agreeing with, with the hypothesis that we had. Not a direct uh, action against pathogen themselves. There's lots of people working on applying different kinds of nanoparticles to crop pathogens to specifically target the pathogen itself to kill the fungus or whatever. And we're not seeing that with these in vitro studies, the copper, the manganese, the zinc was talking about. That. They're not directly acting against the pathogen. What they're doing is they're stimulating 
defense. We're giving it enough of the nutrients so that it can defend itself. So what got us the grant was we actually did some back of the envelope cal calculations. Our, our experiment was actually of a quarter of an acre, so we multiplied by four, but we figured we spent $44 for an acre's worth of copper oxide nanoparticles, and we increased the yield of eggplant, the, the fruit that's produced, um, at market value from about $17,500 to $27,650. So a, a $44 investment of, for a nutrient, and we got that much increase in yield. So we took that to USDA, and they, they funded our project a year ago. Uh, so last year, we scaled up, obviously. We did lots of studies with eggplant, watermelon, asparagus. Roberto, who's in the audience here somewhere, uh, he's the postdoc working on a lot of, this, uh, a lot of these projects. Uh, we're focusing on a range of nanoparticles, but copper really just seems to be the one that, that, that stands out. Uh, we're using multiple soil types, multiple concentrations. I've got collaborators in Texas and Alabama. They're using different crops. Uh, so we, we've really got a, a fair amount of work targeting this, this type of question. Uh, and we've started collaborating with uh, the Center for Sustainable Nanotechnology, where instead of just using commercially available particles, they're going to start making specific particles that do target uh, uh, to behave in, in predictable ways. Uh, and then I mentioned this small Department of Agriculture grant that we got. Why this is interesting is we're actually going to start working with strawberries. And here, the pathogen is not a fungus. The pathogen is actually a nematode. So we're going to see if we can translate this, this uh, defensive system to a, to a different type of disease. Uh, and this is, uh, this is one other project that I have going with a group in China, Wuhan University of Technology. Uh, this actually, we are directly targeting the pathogen itself. This is a turf grass pathogen, uh, so golf course like that. Uh, but what we, and, and the issue with a lot of these pathogens is there's a lot of resistance. That develops in these organisms so you got to add more and more fungicide and, and it's less and less effective so what we did here was we we started using zinc oxide and, and silver nanoparticles and uh investigating you know whether these are going to be viable alternatives uh for treating types of diseases uh and did, did some molecular work to try and figure out the mechanism so this this is interesting but this is really just getting started so that's the application end of kind of what we have going on uh, which leaves the implications end or the nanotox portion. Uh, and almost all of my work is funded by USDA. Uh, and um, as I mentioned, it's, it's really along, uh, the implications work is really along three basic lines of investigation. Figuring out the mechanisms by which plants are responding to a nanomaterial exposure and how those mechanisms differ as a function of particle size, um, nanoparticle versus non-nanoparticle. These issues of trophic transfer and, on, and then also co-contaminant interactions. Uh, and then this was a paper that uh, one of my postdocs and I wrote in uh, Nano Impact, which is an excellent new journal, uh, and kind of highlighted where we thought agricultural research with regard to nanotechnology really needs to, needs to go. So mention some of the uh, kind of molecular-based work first. Um, so this was a study we published last year. I had an Italian postdoc uh, in my office for two years. Uh, and in this case, this set of experiments, we took zucchini and tomato, and we exposed them to a range of different nanoparticles, as well as the bulk and the ionic particles. And we measured all the physiological endpoints that we typically do, but we also looked at uh, a range of genes. And the genes we looked at were actually based off a study the Italians had done the year before, with Arabidopsis and quantum dots, they found about 250 genes that were uniquely up or down regulated upon exposure. So when Luca came over, he found 70 of those genes. He found homologs for 70 of those genes in, in zucchini and um, tomato. So those, th that was the basis of the, the choice of genes. This is just showing you, you know, kind of the basic background, background information. Uh, this was a, a nice electron micrograph we had. This is actually, uh, a zucchini leaf tissue. So the exposure was in the root system, but we've got copper oxide, significant quantities of copper oxide nanoparticles uh, in, um, in the cellular structure of the leaves. So I'm not going to go through the, the whole, you know, 
litany of results that we found. What the Italian group was really interested in was biomarkers. They were interested in specific genes that could be looked at to indicate that a crop, a food crop, had been exposed to a nanomaterial. Uh, and we found two of interest. One's a heat shock protein and one is this chloroplast electron carrier. Uh, the numbers correlate back to the original Arabidopsis study. That's, that's why they have these weird names. Uh, and this, this electron carrier, this, this chloroplast activity is really interesting because in multiple different experiments done in my group and others, um, you know, the, the activity in the chloroplast, the toxicity in the chloroplast seems to be very significant. Uh, so this, this is one that we're very interested in. Uh, so you're all probably familiar how you read these heat maps. Uh, some of the interesting things that came out of this study were the species-specific differences. So this is just 35 of the 70 genes. So this is how this is how zucchini responded to copper oxide nanoparticle exposure, and then this is tomato. So in the tomato, you see a completely different response, much more upregulation up than you get with zucchini. Uh, and we saw, you know, similar similar differences based on the um, the particles as well. Uh, so then the obvious question is, how important is the response as a function of size? So we took the seven most impacted genes. We went back and did the comparison to the bulk and the ionic uh, forms of the, of the elements and compared that to the nanoparticle. And for zucchini, what we saw is that for all seven of these genes, the, it was a, a nano-specific effect. The three nanoparticle treatments all grouped differently from their ionic and bulk forms which again is interesting if you're really talking about looking for a biomarker because you want a marker that's specific to a nanoparticle, not something, uh, not the element in and of itself. Tomato, we did okay. We did two out of three. It was, it was a nanoparticle specific response, but lanthanum we've seen in a range of other studies is, is behaves differently uh, than, than some of these other nanoparticles that we looked at. So we published that study in 2016. Luca still had a year left about on his fellowship. Uh, and at about that same time, I don't know, I didn't point it out, um, but I got sent a product from a, co a company in California, uh, and it's a, a nutrient solution for, um, it's a fertilizer for plant growth, and they claim it's nine different nutrients uh, in nanoscale form. And you're just supposed to apply this to your plants, and they'll, they'll be wonderfully huge and produce all this, all this fruit. And that got us to thinking, you know, when you look at the plant nanotoxicology literature, we couldn't really think of any studies where people had exposed uh, plants to multiple nanoparticles at the same time. So the, the design we said decided to do was to pick five nanoparticles and then expose specifically zucchini to either the, the nanoparticle alone or in combination with another nanoparticle. And I'm not going to go through the data for this experiment, largely because it takes about an hour to explain it all because of all the different possible combinations. Um, but we did the same thing. We did physiology. We did molecular response. It's in, under review right now at ES Nano. Uh, and so this, this, this is a chord diagram that kind of conveys the complexity of interactions you have with different nanoparticle combinations. But the take-home message was uh, we called it contaminant effects, but if you expose the plant to two nanomaterials, probably not surprisingly, that plant responds differently than it does when you look at either one of those nanomaterials alone. We had examples of uh, additive effects, examples of antagonistic effects, and probably synergism in one case, although we didn't have enough data to really say one way or the other. But the point for us was exposing a plant to a single nanoparticle is different than when you're exposing it to multiple particles. And that's important when you start thinking about some of these products that are out on the market or, you know, manufacturers are just dumping all this stuff in at once. Uh, and this was one other mechanistic study I wanted to, to mention. This was a, a paper we published in, in, at the end of 2016. Uh, and this was interesting because uh, this was with a group at Ocean University in China. Uh, looked at Arabidopsis, which is a plant I don't like to use too much, but, but we do use it sometimes. Uh, and we exposed it to copper oxide, nanoparticles, bulk particles, and, and ions. And the idea was to try and figure out two things. One, were there going to be transgenerational effects if you expose the parent, what was going to happen with the seeds and the seedlings from the, the next generation? And then secondly, we, we wanted to look more closely at this, this chloroplast um, response that we saw in some of our other studies. So the trans transgenerational effects issue was, yes, uh, you do see effects. So you expose the parent 
grow the plant through its life cycle, collect the pollen and germinate the pollen, collect the seeds that result after fertilization and germinate those seeds. And we saw effects all the way through. And this is just some of the data here that you can see uh, if you want to look through it. But things like, um, uh, so these are the next generation seedlings as well. Uh, th things like root length of the of that F1 generation, that next generation, things like germination of the pollen, uh, all were significantly reduced when there was an exposure to a reasonably high concentration of copper oxide nanoparticles. And this gets to this fund fundamental issue of toxicology. It's all about the dose. I mean, if you apply the copper oxide nanoparticles in one form, in one way, at one concentration, you suppress disease and you get greater growth. But if you supply it under another scenario, you have toxicity. So the important point was we did show transgenerational effects. The next generation of, of the food crop was compromised, or in this case, the Rabidopsis. Um, I'm skipping over significant portions of this study just to really focus on um, this mechanism that we kind of figured out. So we have molecular parts of this, and we showed that expression of a specific uh, superoxide dismutase related to uh, uh, some of the ROS levels we were detecting uh, and transport inhibitors. We took all of that data together uh, and we were able to really figure out what the and in this case, what was happening was these copper oxide nanoparticles just they're both in the brain itself. So we're we're disabling the photosynthetic system by knocking out electron transport between two of these quinones, which you can kind of see in here where we're where we're knocking these out. Uh, and you're getting an accumulation of electrons, you're getting of oxygen species and you're getting the resulting toxicity which you can physically see with the plant but you know we were because of, and by by we, you know my chinese collaborators did did almost all of this work we were really able to kind of focus in on what this mechanism of toxicity was uh, so the next next set of studies that uh, we're looking at is trophic transfer uh, and these are really fun experiments to run if you don't have to be the one running them uh, they're actually very difficult to do, uh, but the, the scenario is fairly straightforward. You take a nanoparticle, you put it in the soil, then you put a plant in that soil, and you grow the plant. Uh, and then you harvest the plant, and obviously you look at the plant itself, and, and most of the work we've been doing, it's ICP and all the physiology. But then you take some of those plant tissues, and then you feed them to an herbivore. Uh, and then you look at the herbivore, you look at its tissues, you look at its feces, and then you take some of that herbivore and you feed it to, in this case, a carnivore. And uh, these were wolf spiders that we never, ever, ever used again. We only used them once. Um, they're about the size of a silver dollar. They're extremely aggressive and they're very fast when they escape. And nobody except Roberto liked them. Uh, so we never use those again. But anyway, the idea is to track how the nanomaterial is moving through this model food chain and how that differs from, say, a non-nanomaterial. Uh, so the first experiment was cerium, bulk versus nanoparticle cerium. Uh, we used a really high concentration because we never had done this before and we what was going to happen. Uh, so we were at 1,000 ppm, and then we, we ran it through <clears throat> the food chain. So we got some really interesting data. We published this at the end of 2014. Uh, and one of the things that was interesting is lots of people are talking about using cerium uh, in agricultural applications because it increases plant growth. Many people have shown this, uh, and I'm not sure the mechanisms completely worked out, but we saw that when you looked at the stem tissue, this is the red's the nanoparticle, but we also saw it with the bulk cerium as well, uh, and the leaf tissue. So you get this boost in vegetative growth. But what was interesting is nobody had ever looked at the reproductive tissues when you're applying the nanoparticle cerium, but we did. And what we found was this increased vegetative growth that you're getting with the cerium application is at the expense of reproductive tissues. So you're getting significant, in this case, we were just looking at flowers, but this is the sort, this is your yield if you're the grower. So if you're applying cerium because you think you're going to get increased plant growth, but you're actually getting decreased yield, that's a, that's a problem. Uh, so the other uh, things that we found is that in this experiment, the particle size did make a difference. This is the root tissue. So you got 1,000 ppm cerium in the soil. When you look at the roots, if that cerium was in the nanoparticle form, which is the red, 
you get significantly greater quantities, four to five times more cerium than you do as compared to the bulk exposure at the same level. Uh, this was one of the first studies to actually show this in soil. Others had shown it in uh, different media, but we showed it here in soil. This greater burden of cerium, we don't know the form because it's just ICPMS, but the greater burden of cerium in the roots carries all the way through the food chain. It go, you see increased concentration in the roots, the leaves, or the, excuse me, the stems, the leaves, the flowers, you find increased levels in the cricket tissues and the cricket feces, and I don't have the spider data, but we have that as well. Um, so the particle size made a difference in this case, uh, but we didn't see biomagnification, and that was important. We actually saw 10 to 100 fold decreases at each level. So you got 1,000 ppm in the soil. By the time you went to the, to the stems that the crickets were gonna eat, you were down to one ppm, because this is PPB on the Y scale here, Y axis. And then when you went to the crickets that ate the leaves, you went from 1 ppm to less than 0.1. So we were seeing particle size dependent transfer, but it was not biomagnification. And that was, that was important. The other thing that was interesting is when you looked at the animals, the crickets, what they were retaining in their tissues was about 10 times less than what they were excreting. So most of the cerium that they were consuming, they were just releasing, which is good if you're the cricket. If you're out in the environment and you come across that little steaming pile of cricket feces and interact with it, that's obviously ex an exposure issue, but um, mo much of what they consumed was released. This was a follow-up experiment we did. Uh, this was actually done at the University of Texas. The idea here was let's keep the particle the same but change everything else, and that's always a mistake because you get completely different results. Um, so we used a soil from Texas, we used a different set of insects and a different plant, different set of insects. Uh, but we did get some interesting results. Um, the first thing that we noticed is that we changed all of those parameters, particle size didn't make a difference anymore. So the accumulation in this case in kidney bean was the same, whether the particle was in nanoparticle form or bulk form. Uh, and we looked actually at three different times during the growth period, but the bulk is the yellow and the, the red is the nanoparticle. So no, no difference in this case. But when you looked at the insects, the animals uh, here, when we looked in the, the bean beetle, which is, is these guys, so we actually looked at the three different life stages, and we did see this time-dependent increase in accumulation as you went from larva pupa to adult. Uh, which, which was interesting, and also we ended up with some biomagnification. So these little horizontal lines here are actually the concentration in the tissues these organisms were consuming. So by the time you get to the adult form, they are accumulating significantly more. When you look at these, you see what you'd expect. There's a time-dependent decrease in the fecal content uh, of these organisms. When you looked at the predator, it was back down uh, lower again. But for the most part, particle size really didn't matter in this experiment. This is the last trophic transfer experiment I'll show you. We just published this one earlier this year, last month, I think it came out. Uh, and in this case, we did a number of things. We, we switched to copper oxide because obviously we're really interested in copper now. Uh, the, the most interesting thing we did was we introduced a weathering portion to this experiment. Uh, and that's, you can see listed here, maybe not. Oh, well, there it is. Um, so we added the copper to the soil and then we put the plant in immediately or we put the plant in 60 days. So to allow it to, to what we call weather, but you know, who, who really knows what's going on. Uh, the soil was contaminated with weathered organic compounds. We're not gonna look at that data at all, but we did the same thing. We tracked the copper in the different treatments through the different uh, stages and we had some beam line time uh, in Grenoble, so I'll show you a little bit of that data as well. So in the leaf tissue, the uh, nanoparticle size made no difference at all. The weathering made no difference. Where we did see a difference was in the roots, uh, and that's the data you see here. Uh, so in this case, the bulk is uh, the green, the nanoparticle form is red. So this is the unweathered situation. So this is copper in the roots of plants that were added to the soil at the, you know, basically the day after the nanoparticle went in. Uh, and then this is the root data from plants that waited 60 days before they went in. Uh, and what was interesting was we saw this particle size difference. So in this case, uh, what you see is if you weather the copper and it's in its bulk form, you actually see a decrease in the availability uh, of, of that nutrient. Uh, 
But when it's in its nanoparticle form, you get the exact opposite effect. You actually see increases in the amount of copper showing up in the roots. Unfortunately, the rest of this experiment was a complete bust, largely because we picked the, the wrong nanoparticle. Uh, we picked copper, and once you get above the plant level, there's plenty of copper in these organisms. And not only were we not seeing differences based on particle size, but we weren't even above background levels for the controls. So, uh, which was unfortunate because this was our first experiment with a vertebrate. We were using lizards, but the rest of the experiment kind of fell flat. But this part ended up being really interesting, this weathering. Because when we got on the beam time beam line, we noticed two things, the first of which wasn't surprising. Uh, and that was related to the distribution of the copper on the roots. When the, when the copper, when the, the plants were not exposed, when they were exposed to the unweathered copper, the distribution of copper in and on the roots was very heterogeneous. It was very spotty. But when the copper had weathered first, it was much more homogeneous. But that, that's not a surprising finding. Uh, the really interesting part was when you looked at the speciation of the copper in those roots. In the unweathered scenario, most of the copper that you find in those roots is still in its original oxidation state. Uh, the copper too. But when you looked in the roots of plants that were exposed to copper that had previously been weathered, none of that copper is in its original oxidation state anymore. It's been completely reduced to other species. Uh, and that's interesting because that we think that reduction right there, whoops, see if I can go backwards. That reduction transformation right there may be explaining this phenomenon that we see. So we've got a particle size specific transformation that's happening in soil, and it's directly affecting the availability of this, in this case, a nutrient, but it could be a non-nutrient. It's affecting the amount moving in to the plant. So that was, that was pretty interesting. So last part I'll subject you to is this issue of co-contaminant interactions. There's already lots of other different kinds of chemicals and uh, elements in agricultural soils. What's going to happen when nanomaterials get thrown into the mix? You, know, you could, and, and we've shown some of this already. You could have bioavailability issues. If your nanomaterial is increasing the uptake of some of these old organochlorine insecticides like DDE and chlordane, you could have a food safety issue. My lab does the regulatory testing. Uh, the regulatory level, the tolerance levels for persistent organic pollutants in food is about 100 parts per billion. So you don't need a significant increase to, to go above, a, above a, a tolerance level or a violation. And then the other issue is economic. If somebody decides to put carbon nanotubes in their fertilizer because carbon nanotubes increase plant growth, but then that grower applies the fertilizer with the nanotubes and then puts atrazine or something else in the soil, and the atrazine binds to the nanotubes, then the grower is not adding as much atrazine as he's going to need to add to get to get his crop. So there's multiple issues here. Uh, and, and we've actually done a fair amount of work in this area, even though it was initially we considered it to be kind of an add-on set of projects. These are just all the publications. Uh, I only throw this up here to show you the, the answer is yes. Engineered nanomaterials interact significantly with other, and most of our focus has been on organic molecules in agricultural soils. Sometimes they de the nanomaterial decreases the availability of the pesticide. Uh, or in one case, the heavy metal. In other cases, it increases the uptake. So uh, it's very case specific. It depends on the species of plant you're using, but the interactions are, are important. So I'll just show you two experiments to kind of convey this point, maybe three experiments. Uh, this, was, this was one of our interesting ones. We actually published it in 2013. Uh, this was a soil that was contaminated with weathered chlordane at about two ppm. Uh, and chlordane, we uh, we quantify as three separate components. We used four plants. We used two carbon nanomaterials at multiple concentrations, put the carbon nanomaterial into the soil where the contaminant already is, grow the plants, and see what happens. Where does the chlordane go as a function of nanomaterial exposure? Uh, and for the carbon nanotubes, we got exactly the data we were expecting. Uh, and the, the bars are tricolored, tri remember, because there's three components to chlordane. But what you saw is the more carbon nanotubes you added to the soil, and we got to some ridiculous levels here, 5,000 ppm, the less chlordane you find in the plant. And that's completely expected. We know you add activated carbon, you add biochar to soil, you decrease the availability of organic contaminants. That's what we expected to see. We saw it with chlordane. We saw it with DDT plus metabolites, so we call it DDX. This is the zucchini data. 
We didn't really see it when we added fullerenes. You saw a drop off, but it wasn't dose dependent with chlordane. And with, with DDX, we didn't see any effect at all. The, the C60 had no impact, even all the way up to 5,000 ppm. When we looked at some of these other plant species, for the carbon nanotubes, the tomato and the corn behave exactly as we predicted, dose dependent decrease in accumulation. When you looked again at the fullerenes, you're getting different effects. The corn looks a lot like the zucchini data with a slight drop, but it's not dose dependent. And then we've got the tomato data over here where actually fullerenes at the higher concentrations are increasing DDE uptake. Uh, so this was the most interesting thing about this study to me was that you have a carbon nanomaterial. All you've done is you've changed the morphology, you've changed the shape, and you get a completely different interaction with a contaminant in soil. Uh, this is just to show you that we don't always work with plants. This was an earthworm study. This just came out earlier this year as well. The same soil was contaminated with chlordane. Uh, we wanted to see what happened. We had earthworm, we added silver nanoparticles. Where was the chlordane? We added silver type nanoparticles with different coatings, none of which ultimately ended up mattering. Uh, and then uh, the ionic form as well. So the, the worms are in for 14 days, then we do ICP and GCMS to figure out what's going where. So this is the silver data and what we showed here. And so three different concentrations, we can just look at the low concentration of silver. And what you see here is that the, the particle size actually did matter. And this was interesting for us because we do all of our work with plants and we had shown that particle size made a difference with plants a lot of times, not all the time. Uh, but we showed it made a difference here as well. So this is, this is the bulk treatment here, uh, and then this is the ionic, but then these are the three different nanoparticle treatments. So if the silver is present in nanoparticle form, you find a lot more silver in the tissues of the earthworm after you've depurated it. But this was the interesting part. This is the concentration of chlordane present in the earthworm tissues. Uh, and again, just look at the low concentration of silver up here. Here's your control. Uh, this is the bulk form of silver at 500 ppm. You still have a, a pretty significant amount of chlordane in the, in the tissues of these worms. But look what happens when that 500 ppm silver is in nanoparticle form. You get pretty dramatic decreases uh, in the amount of chlordane showing up in these earthworm tissues. And there was no toxicity here at all. I mean, the worms looked fine. The biomass was fine. So something interesting, and we have no idea what, but something interesting was going on that was shutting down um, chlordane accumulation when silver nanoparticles were present. So this is the last experiment I'll show. And I guess I have to give the caveat now that Roberto has actually rerun this experiment and we're still reanalyzing the data, but I'm gonna, I'll go with the data that we had originally. Uh, this was an interesting experiment where um, we added silver and cerium oxide nanoparticles to soil, put in zucchini, but then also added imidacloprid. Imidacloprid is a neonic insecticide. It's of great concern for its in, um, potential role in pollinator decline. So we picked zucchini because I knew we could get a lot of pollen from zucchini flowers. So we, I really wanted to see if the nanoparticles were going to impact the amount of imidacloprid that was moving from the soil into the plant and specifically into tissues that honeybees were gonna be interacting with. And the answer initially at least seemed to be yes. I guess the, the real answer is still out. Uh, this is just the ICPMS data, and I switched my colors here, so sorry about that. But again, in both cerium and silver, the green is the nanoparticle form. If the exposure is in nanoparticle form, you find more of the element in the tissue. Not surprising at this point. So what happened in imidacloprid uh, content? And imidacloprid we did by LCMS. Um, we also, it was total imidacloprid, so it was parent plus four metabolites. And we did see interesting things in, for example, roots and flowers. This is bulk cerium. Uh, and you're seeing increases in the midacloprid uh, when there's a bulk cerium exposure and don't really know what's going on there. But this was what I was really after. So this is the pollen content of imidacloprid, the imidacloprid content of pollen. And when you expose the plant to silver nanoparticles, what you see is a 10 to 15% increase in the amount of imidacloprid in, in the pollen grains itself. Uh, and, you know, these, these neonics are really toxic to the pollinators. So this slight increase may or may not be uh, important, but at least it's uh, something we wanted to look at. So I'll just uh, conclude here uh, and kind of 
you know, give you the take home message, which is that, you know, we've got a really culture and food production uh, related to doing, producing enough food efficiently enough to feed everybody. And um, I've come to the conclusion that nanotechnology really has a big role here. I mean, to, to help solve this problem, but we have to do it smartly. We have to do it strategically. We can't just be doing what I have a feeling some companies are doing right now, which is just dumping all sorts of nanomaterials into all sorts of products and seeing what's happening. That's not the way to do this. Uh, so that's why we're, we're kind of taking this approach of really um, going from molecular all the way up to field studies and tr really trying to get a handle on, you know, what's driving these, these mechanisms. Uh, and so, and you know, the the level of complexity of results we've we've gotten is is going to be an issue as well. I mean, we get differences with soil type. Sometimes we get trophic transfer. Sometimes we don't. We get co-contaminant interactions. Um, we haven't really looked at all at what's happening in the rhizosphere or with endophytes with with plants. Uh, and then we're constantly suffering from a lack of ability to really track particles when they're in soil. Uh, and that's a major issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, so just to, to list uh, some of the collaborators, I have Phil and his group up here first. Obviously, I didn't show any of the work we're doing with him. We're uh, collaborating with him on a, uh, some of the work he's doing with uh, the model gastrointestinal system. Uh, but with some of our LCMS capability, I, I think we have potential to do things like work on coronas of particles as they're moving back and forth. So I, I think we're going to start moving on some of those things as well. But obviously, with this breadth of work, this is a huge team of people working both at the experiment station and elsewhere to, to kind of address some of these questions. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, Jason, for a very informative uh, presentation. We have time for a few questions from the audience, and then we can take questions from online uh, participants. Well, thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I had a comment and a question. I was surprised about that plants are starved for the micronutrients where you started. I would have thought that things evolved into some kind of a sweet spot. So I was a little surprised about that. My question is, what's known about how nanoparticles are taken up in the roots and transport mechanisms in the, in the plant. How much do we know about that? Uh, I would say next to nothing. I mean, I, I showed you that electron micrograph where we put copper oxide nanoparticles in the soil and we had copper oxide nanoparticles in the leaf tissue. I have no idea how those copper oxide nanoparticles got in the leaf tissue. Um, I, it's possible they were accumulated as particles and transported that way. It's also possible that that copper dissolved to ionic form in the soil. The ion was accumulated just like all other ions are accumulated by plants and they happen to be deposited into a vac vacuole that had a reducing environment and we ended up with nanoparticles. Um, uh, you know, there's some people who've done some work with carbon nanomaterials and have shown that those um, are present in plant tissues and in that case, you're not getting dissolution. There is no dissolution. Uh, but I, I, you know, the real the real thing that needs to be done is kind of a, a real time tracking of of particles during the exposure to see what happens. Um, for some of these that are nutrients, I think the mechanisms could be easier to figure out. For something, you know, like carbon, it's going to be a little harder. More questions from the audience. A major concern uh, in people are zinc deficiency, iron deficiency, iron iodine deficiency. Um, you didn't say much about the incorporation of these metals into food that people would eat. Is that something that you're working on to deal with some of these uh, micronutrient deficiencies? My group is not specifically working on that, but one of the collaborators on my grant, he works at the uh, IFDC, so that's the International Fertilizer Development Corporation. I think that's what it is. Uh, but their, their long-term interest is ultimately in coming up with fertilizer formulations where you can much more effectively essentially biofortify foods. Uh, and zinc and some of these others are, are of definite interest to them. But my group specifically, we're not, we haven't really looked at that. And a comment about what you said about copper, we've seen exactly that with cerium oxide nanoparticles where we put in nanoparticles, we then find them somewhere else, but they're not the same particles. The cerium oxide has dissolved and then has been bioprocessed to create new uh, cerium uh, 
particles rather than cerium oxide they're cerium phosphate or something like that so it's true just because you see particles in one place and you see them again doesn't mean it's the same particles exactly uh, I'm, I'm completely convinced this process whether it's in plants or people it's com it's completely dynamic and at least in in plants that that has been almost completely ignored i think um, and you know the the ultimate goal is to try and assess exposure and risk and feel if there's something here that needs to be regulated. Um, but if you're not running the experiments correctly, you're not going to get the data you need to make that decision. A question: uh, You pointed out uh, that the dose makes the poison. So do we have any idea in terms of the concentrations of all these nanoparticles uh, out in the field? Is, is it any data available? Uh, I, I think a few people have published numbers, and I, I can't remember them off the top of my head, but I, I remember seeing a couple papers talking about concentrations of silver nanoparticles in like biosolids that come through wastewater treatment. And, you know, it's in, in the very low PPM range. For things like uh, gold and silver, I think we're in the PPB range. So, I, you know, I, I think maybe the point that you might be trying to get at is what, what does it mean when I dump a thousand ppm cerium into a soil and measure trophic transfer? Uh, maybe nothing uh, other than to see if the phenomena happens or not. Um, in that, that one review article we published, that was, that was a point that we made, and I'm as guilty as anybody else, but you know, there's, a, there's a lot that's been published on plant interactions with nanoparticles. Most of it is you know, short-term exposure to high doses over relatively um, short periods of time. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I was trained as a toxicologist and that, those are the experiments you run first when you wanna see if you have something you're worrying about. But then once you have that data, you gotta work yourself back down that dose response curve to, to get to realistic exposures and, and you know, no, nobody's there yet. And most people aren't even moving in that direction. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the online participants? Um, okay, the question is, you said that nanomaterials are entering directly into agricultural soils, directly, um, sorry, directly um, by a fertiliz fertilizers and pesticides. Do you mean that there are inc incidental nanomaterials or engineered nanomaterials in pesticides and or fertilizers? Have engineered nanomaterial pesticides and or fertilizers been commer commercialized in the U.S.? Did they receive regulatory review by U.S. agencies? And that was from Steve Suppin. Um, so the answer is yes. <laughs> um, there are nanomaterials that have incidental, there are pesticide and fertilizer formulations that have kind of incidental nanomaterials in them. If you... Um, the one example I know is coside, which is a commercially available fungicide that's been around for years. If you do electron microscopy on the regular formulation that they sell at Home Depot and Lowe's and everywhere else, you will find a significant portion of the, the particles in, in nanoscale range. And I, I, I'm not convinced that's intentional. I think that's just a function of how the material is synthesized. In addition to that, there are commercial you can buy on Amazon, Amazon Prime, that have, have claimed to have nanomaterials in them, both fertilizers and pesticides. Obviously, the claim is the important point because, you know, you, you have to itself to see what's in there. Um, these, these products are commercially available. I mean, you know, when I talk to the regulatory community, you know, it's kind of like the, the horse has already left the barn on this one. I mean, these materials are out there. Just they've been in cosmetics, you know, for 30 years. Um, so, you know, the, the issue is actually trying to figure out whether whether there's a significant risk that's different from other other. The questions about regulations, uh, you know, the, I think the. The, the regulatory framework, I don't know a lot about this, um, but I, I think FDA and EPA are the two regulatory bodies in this country that are gonna um, you know, have, have authority here. Uh, and um, you know, five years ago, I, I don't, I'm not sure anybody was really thinking about particle size as important. 
uh, now I think I think it is a consideration. But I, I think if you know a pesticide manufacturer wanted to produce a new formulation of their product, and it was in nanoscale form, I think the regulatory hurdle that they would have to jump to bring that new formulation to market is low. Uh, and I'm not sure there's a whole lot of size specific toxicity data. There's any. Um, I think I answered the questions. Yes, um, there is one more question from online. Um, this is from Suh Suh Suhail Al Abed. Uh, the transformation of nanoparticles is a function of the environment where they are found. Have you looked at different soil types in your studies and how they impact transformation or speciation? Um, haven't done this systematically, uh, and uh, but every, we've done it a couple of times. I guess the problem is every time we've changed soil type, we've also changed something else that we're looking at. Uh, so we, I, I can't definitively say that soil type matters, but I, I know it really does. <laughs> um, and um, I, I don't think that's surprising. I mean, we know soil type will dramatically influence the, the half-life of endosulfan or atrazine or you know, any other organic chemical that goes in there. Uh, and it'll impact the transport of elements that are that are in there, uh, and heavy metals that are added. So, um, soil type is is really, I think, is really important. I don't know how important it is, uh, but clearly, it's going to impact you know the availability of these materials to to organisms that are in the soil, whether it's plant, invertebrate, or other otherwise. Uh, and you know, and, and soil is not just soil. I mean, it's the inorganic component, but you also have you know the the microbiome and the protozoa and the fungi that are all there, and those are all going to be interacting with these materials as well. One more. So you talked about gene expression studies. Uh, so my question is, when you do these gene expression studies, which plant tissue you, do you use? Because the roots might have different genes expressing and the leaves might have different types of gene sets expressing in themselves. So which tissue do you use? Um, Nubia and Roberto can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we've only done this two or three times. We do the whole plant, right? So we're, most of the time we're dealing with small seedlings. So we'll just take shoots and roots together and, and do the whole plant, which isn't ideal, but given resources, it's the, the first step. Thank you. That's the last question though. It's actually how important the answer is, not how quick the question is. <laughs> That's true. Um, would you characterize your impact studies as life cycle assessments? If so, how, and if not, what else would be required to make the impact studies uh, life cycle assessments? Um, I, I wouldn't characterize them as life cycle assessment. I mean, there are specific ways to do life cycle studies, and we've done some experiments where we try to take things, you know, to seed or to flower or to fruit. Um, but we've never actually done an experiment where the goal was to go through the entire life cycle and look at all the different components of an LCA, um, because that isn't necessarily easy to do, especially with a crop in soil. We've gotten pieces of it, I guess. That's what I would say. Thank you so much, uh, Jason, sure. for the presentation. Uh, thank you all. Thank you.